Thank you for tuning into the podcast of Life Church in Perry, Georgia. Hey, everybody, welcome to Life Church. This is Pastor Tim. We're so excited that you've joined us. Uh, we are going to probably go fast and and get a lot done. I hope you like to take notes. I will try to make sure that you get all of these scriptures. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time um, with uh, the greeting today because uh, we're in Romans chapter 11, and we're going to cover 11, verse 11 through 36. Romans chapter 11, verse 11 through 36. Sounds like a lot, but I'm going to try to uh, uh, compress some of this um, based on what we talked about last week. So let's just dive in. Romans chapter 11, verse 11. Paul says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So what he's talking about here is the many promises that were made to Israel in the Old Testament um, have not been canceled. All the things God said to Abraham, all the things God said to Moses, all the things that were said to, to, to promise Israel about land, about um, the, the multitude of people, uh, their, their rightful heir uh, in the Davidic covenant, all of those things, they, they've not been canceled. God's upset, but he's not, he's not taken away. It's kind of like mom and dad. You know, you go out and you do something you shouldn't have done and you broke a rule. Uh, mom and dad may ground you. You may get a punishment. You may get your phone taken away. But they're not going to say, you're no longer my, my child, okay? So, so they're, they're, they're right uh, as children of uh, God, as the right um, as the children of Israel have not been canceled, they relate to matters of national p- position and blessing. These these promises that God made relate to the matters of national position and blessing. And we discussed last week um, the first part of this this chapter um, really shows Israel's failure is neither complete. Uh, which we looked at through through verses 1 through 10, or are they permanent in verses 11 through 36 that we're looking at today? So so last week we looked at, again, God's upset. There, there's going to be some things that are going to have to take place or some punishment that he's going to have to do, but it's not permanent. And so now as we turn to this, this part right here, what we're going to begin to look at is that, that God is going to begin to show them what's going to take place in the times to come as these things begin to be restored. So again, Israel's fall is, is, a, is not a complete failure because there's still a remnant made up of Jews like Paul that have accepted Christ Jesus as their Savior. So neither is Israel's fall permanent because God will fulfill His promise to the nation. And it's true that Israel has stumbled, but their failures are not permanent. 1 Corinthians 1.23 says, But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. God will not allow their fall to be the, the dismal climax to a marvelous history. Uh, God has a glorious future in store for the children of Israel. I, I think back to what God told Moses. Remember, he was telling, he told Moses, he said, I'm going to destroy them all and I will grow you anew. And Moses looked at him, he said, he said, but God, he said, you can't destroy them. He said, because after all that's been done, he said, will the other nations look and say, God couldn't control his people, so uh, he destroyed them. And so God did not completely destroy right then. He didn't wipe them off. There was a remnant that still made it into the promised land. It was the next generation that made it in. So God is saying the same thing. He's he's saying, listen, uh, what you've done is terrible, but I'm not going to just do away with you. Your future is glorious. I've got great things that I have promised for you. God has overruled all of Israel's failures, but because of its sal- his salvation, um, because of their failures, rather, his salvation has come to the Gentiles. Just like the sons of Jacob persecuted their brother Joseph and sold him into slavery, God overruled their wicked actions for the good of the Gentiles in Egypt. The, the Jews were provoked to jealousy by observing the blessings that were being poured out upon unworthy Gentiles. So again, 
They, they sell Joseph. They get upset. They're jealous of him. They sell him into slavery. Joseph goes down into Egypt because he's faithful to God, even though he was uh, uh, sold into servanthood, then he was falsely accused, then he was imprisoned and all of these things. He still ends up getting to this place where he's second in command. And then uh, Israel sends his kids, his children, into Egypt. The second visit, they find out who Joseph really is, that, that he is their brother. And, and, uh, and then at the end of Jacob's life, at the end of Israel's life, they, they look and they say, um, will he destroy us for what we did? And he said, what you intended for evil, God will, will use for his good. But they were, they were provoked to jealousy because they saw the blessings that were being poured out on others uh, because they didn't do what they should have done. Uh, Deuteronomy 32.21 says this. Deuteronomy 32.21 They have provoked me to jealousy by what is not God. They have moved me to anger by their foolish idols. But I will provoke them to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move them to anger by a foolish nation. So just as God moved on the Egyptians, God will move on the Gentiles. God is moving today on the Gentiles. This gospel is going forth. And, and here in the United States of America, we're not Jews. Uh, we're, we're Americans or uh, you know, maybe you came from other parts to this land. But you're not Jewish, but you're seeing the blessings of God that are being poured out on us. Now, listen, you look around at this nation, there's nothing more foolish than what's going on right now in the United States of America. But yet God has still blessed us, not in, not, not in place of the Jews, but in spite of their, their rebellion and in spite of their fall, God is blessing a Gentile nation. Romans chapter 11, verse 12 says, Now their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. See, when the Jews rejected Christ, they were set aside as God's witness. Set aside, not done away with, but they were set aside as God's witness. A new people, the church, was placed in, their, in, in line instead of them. So where the Jews rejected Jesus, God raised up this church that, that we're part of and he placed them in line not not to take the place of but he put them in front of because he set israel off to the side the setting aside is not a permanent thing uh, and it has been used for bringing salvation to other gentile nations so in their fall and diminishing, it brought riches. In, in, in Israel's fall and diminishing, it brought riches to the Gentiles. So if it brought riches to the Gentiles, how much better whether it will their restoration be? Okay, we, we struggle with this sometimes. If we look at how great the fall is and how great the punishment uh, that Israel has had to suffer, we have a hard time imagining how great the restoration is going to be. I think about this in my life. There were times where I would do things that, that my dad told me not to do and the punishment was severe. But as long as I took the punishment well, as long as I did what I was supposed to do during that punishment, listen, the, 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 the blessing that came after the punishment was greater than I could have ever imagined during the trial. Okay? <clears throat> Romans chapter 11, verses 13 and 14. He says, For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my <clears throat> ministry, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. Paul stated that he was an apostle to the Gentiles. He magnified his office, uh, that is, his ministry to the Gentiles before the Jews. He, he kind of almost rubbed it in their face that I'm a Jew, but God called me to be a minister to the Gentiles. The Jews did not want the gospel, but they did not want the Gentiles to have it either. Paul was demonstrating before his kinsmen in the flesh that the blessings of his ministry to the Gentiles for God was saving them and filling them with his Holy Spirit. So Paul is in fact saying that he was interested in the Jews for the sake of the Gentiles. So according to the prophets, 
of old, the restoration of Israel will be the starting point for the coming of God's kingdom on the earth. That is important to know. That's why we pray for the nation of Israel. That's why we pray for the diaspora to come back. That's why we need to pray for the Jewish people to be saved. Because according to the prophets of old, according to the word of God, when the children of Israel come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and they come back, that is the point, it's the starting point of God's kingdom here on the earth, His new heavens and His new, new Jerusalem. Knowing the blessings to the world that will be brought by the restoration, Paul wanted to do all that he could to further that goal. He wanted to provoke the Jews to jealousy that they may accept the Messiah and be saved. Romans eleven fifteen 15 says, For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, that will their, what will their acceptance be but life for the dead? Let me say that again, verse 15. If you're following along, Romans eleven fifteen, 15. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? See, up to this point, Paul had spoken mainly of Israel's disobedience and their futile attempts at self-righteousness. But here he begins to reveal God's act of judgment. Uh, Jesus had warned the Jews of this impending judgment. Matthew 21, 43 says, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation, nation bearing the fruits of it. So Jesus told them what was coming, but they, they would not listen to him. They, they turned a deaf ear to what the things that, that the Messiah was teaching. So scripture clearly indicates that after Christ came into his own and his own rejected him, so he was preached to the Gentiles. The failure of Israel brought salvation to the Gentiles. Their fall was the wealth of the world, but their loss, the wealth of the Gentiles. And their casting away was the reconciliation of the whole world. So how much greater will the blessing to the world be when Israel is received back again to full restoration, put back online for God. Isaiah eleven nine says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. See, the nation of Israel will be saved by the sovereign grace of God out from a spiritually dead state and from those who remain spiritually dead. Romans eleven sixteen 16 says, For it is... If the first fruits is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. So Paul uses a picture to show what the Jew, that, that the Jews can never be completely rejected. Why? First, the law provided that all food before it was eaten was to be offered to God. When the dough was being prepared, the first part was to be offered to God. The first fruit of the bread, the first cake, all these things were set aside for the priest. And when that was done, the entire lump of dough became sacred. The offering of the first part sanctified to the whole. So, so as he's setting this up back in the Old Testament in Numbers and he's talking uh, in Leviticus and he's talking about how this is their first fruits we're going to take the first portion out for the priest but then the rest of it even though part has been removed the rest of it's still going to be holy um, you know you think about when Jesus was talking to the Gentile woman and she said that her daughter was demon possessed and Jesus said that has nothing to do with me I was sent to the nation of Israel and he said you know he made the comment about uh, that 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 it wasn't for the dogs. And she said, yeah, but even the dogs get some of the crumbs because even the crumbs are holy. All right. So Numbers 15, 19 through 20 says, Then it will be when you eat of the bread of the land that you shall offer up a heave offering to the Lord. You shall offer up a cake of the first of your ground meal as a heave offering, as a heave offering of the threshing floor. So shall you offer it up. I know that's kind of confusing. Sometimes when we get into numbers in the law, that make, makes no sense. But what you need to understand is that he's saying to them this, when you offer up the offering of the first fruits, everything else becomes holy. Second, he uses this, this 
demonstration of when a sapling is planted, it is dedicated to God. And from then on, every branch that comes from that sapling is sacred to God. So what we need to understand is, is God planted a tree in Israel. Out of that tree became saplings, 12 tribes. And then we, the Gentiles, have been grafted in to that. So we, just like them, we have become sacred to God. A key word to understand here is holy. Be ye holy as he is holy. The meaning is that the call and destiny of Israel sets them apart under God. The first fruits can refer to the first Jews blessed and the gospel and the lump to the whole nation that will be blessed and become holy in the end. Or put it this way, in connection with Israel, the first fruit would be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The lump would be the whole line of descendants from the patriarchs. Does that make more sense? So the root would be Abraham and the branches are the descendants of Israel. I hope that makes sense. God's not going to do away. They, they, are, they are part of the lump. They are part of the tree. He's not going to cut it off or throw away the lump. Romans eleven seventeen through 18 says, If some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were gathered in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. The olive tree is a familiar and beautiful part of the landscape in Israel. It's a symbol of both strength and blessing. The psalmist says in Psalm 52, 8, But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. So Paul uses the branch of the olive tree to picture what God has done in connecting the Gentiles with wild offshoots into the cultivated olive tree, which is Israel. In Paul's metaphor, some of the olive tree branches are broken off and wild shoots are grafted into the tree. God was turning the Gentiles into a fruit-bearing people. This left no room for boasting. Paul told the Gentiles, if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Don't try to take credit for something you didn't do. Paul is pointing to them the very source of their lives, which is God. God is the keeper of the vineyard. God is the ultimate gardener. Romans 11, 19-21 You will say then, branches were broken off that might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief they were broken off and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear for if God did not spare the natural branches, He may not spare you either. See, the Gentiles were now recipients of all the blessings of belonging to God. Many Jews had rejected God and therefore did not receive the blessings. The Gentiles' temptation to boast must have been enormous. I mean, think about this. You are not the chosen, but now you have been chosen. And now you're being blessed, you're bearing fruit. You want to boast about it, but you're being told, don't boast about it. Because that's exactly what the Jews did, is they begin to boast, and then pride set in, and therefore they fell back and were set aside. Paul tells the Gentiles to remember that the only reason they were grafted into the tree of God's kingdom was because they depended on God. If they now let go of their dependence on God, God will just easily break them off of the tree as He broke off some self-reliant Jews. Romans 11.22 says, Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity but toward you goodness, if you continue in His goodness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off. Israel fell in unbelief. 
That brought God's severity, God's judgment upon them. Rejecting the righteousness which God provided in Christ, they followed self-righteousness and pride. They didn't submit to God's provision, but went about to establish their own righteousness uh, through the law, through circumcision, through their own works. While God's severity fell on Israel, His goodness and kindness came to the Gentiles. They were given the place of privilege even though they had not merited the place of blessing. This came about entirely by grace. It was by the goodness of God. The word goodness that Paul uses right here is the same Greek word or root word as kindness. In Matthew 18, 21 through 35, I'm not going to read all that. You can go look at it. But in Matthew 18, 21 through 35, there's a guy that owes the king a lot of money and he pleads with the king to forgive him his debt. The king forgives him a great debt, huge debt. Then this guy goes out and he finds people that owe him some money, but it's a much lesser debt. But they don't have the money to pay and instead he treats them terribly and even has some thrown into jail. When the king finds out what he did, the king brings them back in and says, listen, I showed you kindness, but you did not show the same kindness to those that owed you. So now I'm going to put you into prison until you pay your debt. See, the message is clear. If one is to avoid the severity of God, if one is to avoid being cut off, be he a Jew or a Gentile, he must remain and abide in God's grace. The phrase, if you continue, has a parallel to it in Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, where Paul says, If indeed you continue in faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Remember, Paul's telling him, he says, listen, I'm a Jew, but because of your failure, because you denied the Christ, because you've turned your back on Him, God called me to minister now to the Gentiles salvation through Christ in whom you denied. So these verses make clear that our security in Christ is based on our being willing to continue to abide in Him. Christ is always willing to abide if we will welcome and acknowledge Him as Lord. Some theologians say that Israel, the nation, lost her election, but that's not true. No individual can lose his place in Christ once saved, always saved, is a lie. It's foolishness to say that all sins are sins of society rather than of individuals. That would be trying to say that the whole United States of America, because of their sin, um, is, God is going to do, completely destroy them. All right. The fact is that only an individual can sin and only an individual can be saved. So the only way a nation can fall is by the way of individuals. So if enough individuals sin, which is what the children of Israel did as a whole when they turned their back on God. Paul made this clear in, in this verse, uh, in verse 1 rather, when he showed that he was an individual as a Christian and proved that all Israel had not been cast away. He was a Jew. God, God didn't do away with all Jews because obviously, as I shared with you last week, Paul got saved. Mary, Joseph, Simeon, you look at some of these other Jews that were saved. So neither the position of security nor the position of being cut off is unconditional. Both are conditional on the attitude and will of the individual. God has uh, sovereignly made it so. So what I'm trying to get you to understand is this. It wasn't just one or two Jews. It wasn't just Pharisees that turned their back on God. It was a whole nation of people that turned their back on God. But even at that, God did not turn His back on the whole nation because there were some individuals within the nation that still accepted Jesus. So even though the United States of America is going to hell in a handbasket, and many have turned away from God and many don't worship God, we are still the remnant that worship God. So 
Even though a multitude of this nation may be in sin, there's still a remnant that is not in sin, and God is going to bless those people. Romans 11.23 And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. If Israel will not persist in their unbelief, God is able to graft them in. Israel's blindness will be taken away. The Jews do not have to abide in unbelief just as they did not have to abide in faith. God's not going to force them. He gives them free will. But a broken, dried branch cannot in the natural be grafted back in. But God, who brings life from dead, can graft them back in. Romans eleven twenty four. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to the nature into cultivated olive tree, how much more will those who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? Paul speaks of being grafted contrary to nature. Normally, the good branch or graft is grafted into a poor stock. Uh, the good shoot receives the needed sap for growth from the inferior tree or stock. The grafted branch retains the characteristics and qualities of its own heritage, though it receives the sap of the inferior stock and is thus enabled to produce good fruit. If, if you were to take... I was thinking about this and trying to figure out how to share it with you, and I, I'm even going to be talking about this a little bit on Sunday. But if you were to take a... Uh, an inferior tree, and I can't think of what that may be, but a non-fruit-bearing tree maybe, and, and I was to uh, pull off some of the bark, cut back into the stalk, place a branch from a fruit-bearing tree into that stalk, taped it real good, sealed it up real good, made sure that it got plenty of nutrients, what would begin to happen is that, st that stalk, that branch, would begin to produce fruit even though it's attached to a non-fruit bearing stalk because it's getting its nutrients from that stalk. Does that make sense? So even then, each individual will have to choose just as now the time of the Gentiles, we each have to choose. Not, not every Jew will be saved. Not every Gentile will be saved. Okay? So we, we need to understand if God grafted the wild olive which is the Gentiles into the good stock, which is Israel. He is able to graft the natural branches, which is Israel, back into the good stock once again. I know it sounds confusing. I'm trying to make this clear. Don't know if I'm doing a good job. Israel's decided to separate themselves. They're not bearing fruit. They weren't doing what they were supposed to do. God attached the Gentiles into the stock. Even though the Gentiles were not supposed to be the fruit bearer, the Jews were, God's bearing fruit through the Gentiles. He can do the same thing when He brings the Jews back in to regraft them in. Romans 11.25 For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of the mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of of the Gentiles has come. In his characteristic way, Paul drew attention to the important truth as he used the words ignorant, mystery, blindness, and fullness. Six times in the Apostle Paul's letters, he uses the phrase, I would not have you to be ignorant. We see this in Romans 1.13, Romans 11.25, 1 Corinthians 10.1, 1, 1 Corinthians 12.1, 2 Corinthians 1.8, and 1 Thessalonians 4.13. So in this verse, Paul refers to ignorance concerning a mystery. The word mystery refers to a truth once hidden, but now revealed, the understanding of which requires spiritual perception. So what is the mystery? The mystery is that Israel's blindness and rejection will continue until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. This lines up with the statement of the Apostle James in Acts at the Council of Jerusalem. 
In Acts 15, 14, James says, Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. The blindness of Israel refers specifically to the refusal to see God's plan in Jesus. In a general sense, it describes the spiritual condition of any individual who rejects the light. Because a person refuses to acknowledge God's truth, God gives eyes that cannot see and ears that cannot hear. Romans 11, 26-27 And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, The Deliverer will come out of Zion, and He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is My covenant with them, when I take away their sins. Paul is nearing the end of his argument. As a Jew, he has faced a heartbreaking situation. He has shown, however, that God has turned Israel's failure into salvation for the Gentiles. Now he looks ahead to the glorious prospect all Israel shall someday be saved. He was not saying that all individuals be saved, but he's speaking of a national destiny. Remember, it, it was a nation that turned away, but there were some Jews that still got saved. It will be a nation that will get saved, but there will be some Jews that will still turn away from Christ. So putting it simply, Israel as a nation will be delivered from her enemies, both spiritually and earthly, and be restored to her ancient privileges as God's witnesses. Jesus is the deliverer who will rescue the Jews from their enemies. Zechariah 12.10 says, And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced, Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for his firstborn. Best of all, God will turn away ungodliness. The, the, the reference to taking away their sins leads us back again to the Old Testament where in Isaiah 27, 9, it says, Therefore, by this the iniquity of Jacob will be covered. And this is all the fruit of taking away his sin when he makes all the stones of the altar like chalk stones that are beaten to dust. Wooden images and incense altars shall not stand. Their acceptance of the new covenant of grace, the Jews' acceptance of the new covenant of grace, in contrast to the conditional covenant of Sinai, will, will find will finally find fulfillment in the, in the Old Testament promises of God. Israel's restoration is seen in the restored branches and in the renewed fatness of the olive tree in that day when all Israel shall be saved. God's Word also predicts a restoration of the fig tree which will put forth leaves and bear fruit again. Matthew 24, 32-33 says, Now, Jesus says, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Th this is happening right now, church. This is taking place today. The fig tree is beginning to bud. There are great signs of life in, in, in Israel. Uh, Netanyahu just got put back in as prime minister in Israel. There is coming a day of spiritual revival among Jews. It will be a fulfillment of Ezekiel's vision of the valley of dry bones in Ezekiel 37, where the prophet said they were all dead. But God said, speak to the bones. And he spoke to them. And it says they became an exceedingly great army. Romans 11:28, Concerning the gospel... They are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. The Jews are the enemies of the gospel, but beloved for the Father's sake. Notice two things about this verse. One, the Jews in relation to the gospel are regarded by God as enemies, enemies for the sake of the Gentiles. But secondly, in respect to election, the Jews having been God's choice are beloved for the Father's sake. 
Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He's going to fulfill his promise. So even though they became enemies because of his respect, because of his promises to the forefathers, they are still his beloved. Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says, For the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. Here, Paul is discussing the earthly destiny of Israel, not the heavenly destiny of an individual. The gifts and callings are subject to no recall. They are irrevocable. God will not change His mind regarding His chosen people and their ministry and destiny. His promise concerning them are unconditional. That's, we use this verse often when we talk about people that have been called into the ministry. Listen, people are going to miss it. People are human. Uh, we, we have a sin nature. Uh, but, but just because we miss it doesn't mean that God is done with you. It doesn't mean that God's going to do away with you altogether. There may be, again, a punishment time, but there is a redemption that will come back. Romans eleven thirty through 32 For as you were once disobedient to God, you have now obtained mercy through their disobedience. Even so, these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown, you they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that He might have mercy on all. Paul points to God's mercy four times in these verses. In verse 30, it says there's God's, he talks about there's God's mercy in the Gentiles. Uh, God's dealing with Israel have been a means of extending His grace and mercy to the Gentiles. In verse 31, it relates God's mercy to the Jews. And then in also in verse 31, the Gentiles had been unbelievers but found mercy because of disobedience of the Jews. And then in verse 32, God's mercy reaches to the whole world. Okay, so just in this, these short passages, these uh, verse 30, 31, 32, God is first speaking of the mercy of the Gentiles. Um, then he begins to speak of his mercy to the Jews. And then he ends up speaking of the mercy to the whole wide world. Romans eleven thirty three through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, or who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. So I, I laid out for you, I've done this twice, an outline. So just as the doctrinal portion of Romans, which was Romans chapter 1 through 8, the climax in that glory, in a glorious and grand expression of God's worship, uh, was was in that portion. Then we go to the dispensational portion, which was chapters nine through eleven, which we just finished. This brings a sublime conclusion uh, to these verses. So this this part of the outline, this section, is a uh, a time of praise. It's it's um, it's a time where Paul says, listen, there's going to be a punishment, but I'm going to turn that, God is going to turn that punishment rather into a time of, of praise, a time of blessing. He's already blessed the, the Gentiles because of uh, even though you hardened your heart, but there's going to come a better blessing when your heart is then softened and you come back to me. If, if we do not understand God's ways and His dealings with men, Jew or Gentile, or even with the church, it's because we're unable to comprehend the wisdom and knowledge and the ways of God. Now understand, you may not understand what the heck I'm talking about. Study the Bible. Look in the Word. That's why I constantly keep taking you back, just as Paul takes you back to the Old Testament, to verify the promises. The Bible says, Out of the mouth are two or more, let every word be established. The mind of man constantly searches to know and to understand God's Word. God created man with the ability to understand what he's talking about, but God's thoughts are not man's thoughts, nor are God's ways man's ways. God declared that his thoughts and ways are higher than those of men in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. In verse 36, Paul uses three prepositions to show God is the source of the agency, and the ultimate end. He is the creator, the sustainer, and the goal of all human life. All events 
are of him, through him, and for him. One can only join the Apostle Paul in the outburst of praise to our great God. His greatness and glory are unsearchable, unfathomable, and beyond comprehension. Listen, the gist of it is this. There is coming a day of restoration for all the Jews, and we need to pray for them. The Gentile people have been blessed, and we need to continue to walk in that blessing and keep our eyes firmly fixed on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, help us to have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to this podcast of Life Church in Perry, Georgia. If you don't have a home church, we'd love to have you visit us. Life Church, 100 Todd Road in Perry, Georgia.